the um, let me go back to my my screen here and uh, here we have uh, I don't know how many of you like Picasso but I do I love Picasso this does not look like a Picasso does it um, I don't know if you can see my screen there it's just on half the screen here so here is a beautiful painting from, of one of Picasso's many lovers. He was very famous for having lovers and he would bring them in and take pictures. And uh, he's, he's actually painting a picture of her in this photograph right here. And it's relatively realistic, right? Uh, you get this sense that, wow, I didn't know Picasso was even capable of painting anything that looks relatively realistic. Um, I, it's, it's, it's staggeringly beautiful and more reminiscent of the kind of painting that's happening before modernism, before there is this, this loss of optimism. Well, Picasso is wonderful as a kind of guide to show us what began to happen with artists. So look at this picture, if you will. Here's a, here are other two, two other paintings of the same woman from Picasso, and they're beautiful. These are two beautiful paintings. Anyone who ever says Picasso couldn't paint uh, beautiful paintings and beautiful, more realistic representations hasn't seen some of his earlier work. Now, look at those paintings just for a moment, and now imagine the loss of optimism. Now imagine this terror, if you will, that things aren't as stable as we thought, as William Butler Yeats would describe, that things fall apart. And then suddenly, instead of painting uh, women and men like this, he has this. Okay, this is very shortly thereafter. Okay, now it's easy to look at that and say, he's not very good but he's absolutely spectacularly good. So same guy, same guy. What's happening here is a kind of rejection, if you will, in, and of, of the rational mind. That perhaps how we see things is entirely uh, individual. How we see things is not uh, is not as defined as we thought. And so, but I actually still find this kind of beautiful. And then within a very short time, his women begin to look like this. And this is called woman with a beret. Um, again, it's easy to look at that and say, well, Picasso doesn't know how to paint. That's so not true. What, it, what it's saying is that he is, no longer is subscribing to the old school of thought that somehow there is a set true way of doing things, that, that there is a true way to do art, that there is a true way to do sculpture, that there is a true way to write. Um, that idea is blowing up. Um, well, this becomes, of course, widespread with intellectuals where suddenly I don't know what true is. It almost feels like the whole world becomes pilot. In that scene where Jesus, when he says to Jesus, what is truth? Um, so suddenly it's like the whole world becomes pilot. And um, many of us are familiar with, um, and I'm calling this modernism here. So you look at this difference here. So look at this, from this beautiful picture to this. This is, to me, the best example of what, what modernism does, what this loss of optimism does, and how it's seen in our art. Um, so modernism. Now, many of you are familiar with uh, Frederick Nietzsche, and some people see him as kind of the father of this kind of viewpoint. Uh, this kind of loss of hope, uh, this kind of atheistic uh, 
a loss of rational uh, a belief in rational thought. And he's famous for that saying, God is dead. And I know many of you have heard that expression before from Nietzsche, and we, and we often pillory him for that. We often put him down for that. I actually am going to defend him and, and what he's saying, because he's actually saying something quite profound that I don't entirely disagree with. What he's saying here in the 1880s, early 1880s, he's almost like a prophet. He's looking at the world and where it's going. He can see the seeds of this kind of modernism being planted, this loss of belief in what is rational, this loss of belief, of belief in, uh, in truth. And this, of course, wreaks havoc on faith. And he says, and here is his quote right here. I'm going to move this so we can get this out of the way here so I can see it. He says, God is dead. God remains dead. He doesn't mean, he doesn't believe in God, but he doesn't mean he's not putting down Christians or people who believe in God. He's just saying in the intellectual world, we no longer speak of God. God remains dead, and we have killed him. How shall we comfort ourselves, the murderers of all murderers? What was holiest and mightiest of all that the world has yet owned has bled to death under our knives. Who will wipe this blood from blood off of us? In other words, look at what we've done. In our, as intellectuals, we've taken God out of thought. We've taken God out of the universities. We've taken God out of intellectual ideas. We've taken God out of our art. We've taken God out of everything. And we're the ones who did it. And look at this horrible thing that we have done. What water is there for us to clean ourselves? What festivals of atonement, what sacred games shall we have to invent? Is not that, is not the greatness of this deed too great for us. Must we ourselves not become God simply to, to appear worthy of it? And Nietzsche then very shortly after this will go insane. Actually, he will see he's, he's already kind of going insane um, from a bout of syphilis, gets to his brain. Uh, he goes, goes insane seeing a horse being beaten and he spends about the last 13 years of his life essentially insane. Um, but what he says here is true. I'm going to defend him here that at, from, the, from an intellectual perspective, the world killed God. They no longer took God as a part of the equation. And another, and another passage in that same book, Nietzsche will argue that the 20th century, the one to come, so he's thinking ahead, because of what we've done, because of this new way of thinking, seeing the world, that we can expect to be nothing, to be death like we've never seen before. Because we've removed religion, because we've removed God, um, he predicts that the 20th century will uh, see perhaps 25 million people killed. And instead, he, uh, what he gets is uh, that he gets that totally wrong. What he gets, in, uh, what it ends up being is more like about 120 million dead in the 20th century. The bloodiest, most horrific century in human history is the 20th century. And largely from two atheistic movements. One is National Socialism, Hitler, and the other is Communism. Uh, and together those two are responsible for about 125 million of their own people dead. Not talking about just the deaths from other people in war. A, an incredibly ugly, brutal century because of this new uh, loss of God. This is what modernism uh, is responding to and being afraid of. And um, so I have asked you to read a poem called The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock. 
And uh, just out of curiosity, uh, how many of you took me quite literally and uh, the uh, raise your hand if you did actually read that poem. Okay, a couple of you have. I'm asking you, it's in your book, so it's very easy to get to, but you can also easily find it online. And uh, it's a poem that T.S. Eliot wrote in the early 1910s. And he wrote it when he was 22 years old while he was still in college. So he's a college student. Now granted, he happens to be a brilliant genius college student, as of course all of you are. And he writes perhaps the, the beginning uh, of the first great poem of modernism. And I, I want to study that and uh, I want to spend some time on that. And, uh, but it, um, just to jump, at, jump to it so you can kind of get a sense of it. Here it is, it opens with this quote from Dante's uh, Divine Comedy. This is actually taken from uh, Purgatorio. And, but he opens his poem and he's, and he's speaking in the voice of a kind of fusty, stuffy, but rather uh, nothing of a man named J. Alfred Prufrock. And he says, let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient etherized upon a table. Let us go through certain half-deserted streets, the muttering retreats of restless nights and one-night cheap hotels, and sawdust restaurants with oyster shells, streets that follow like a tedious argument of insidious intent to lead you to an overwhelming question. Oh, do not ask, what is it? Let us go and make our visit. In the room, the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. And I love this next part. The yellow fog that rubs its back upon the window panes, the yellow smoke that rubs its muzzle on the window panes, licked its, licked its tongue into the corners of the evening, lingered upon the pools that stand in drains, let fall upon its back the soot that falls from chimneys, slipped by the terrace, made a sudden leap, and seen that it was a soft October night, curled once about the house and fell asleep. So he's describing already a scene that uh, uh, is beautiful in some ways. Um, the, uh, and yet is miserable. This is not romanticism. This is not like, look how beautiful everything is. This is, look at how drab everything is. Look how pointless everything in the world is. Everything seems pointless. There seems to be no point whatsoever. He's gonna go and he's gonna see people talking and in restaurants, and, but they're not talking about anything really important. Uh, he's gonna look at the city, but the city doesn't seem important. Uh, things are going to be happening around him, but none of that seems important. And most importantly, he doesn't seem important. Um, I want you to read the whole poem. And uh, I'll put a link also if you want an audio version of it to hear it read. And I would like to um, hear your thoughts on it. Um, it's, a, it's really actually quite fabulous. Um, but I'm going to ask some questions, and they will be on. Uh, actually, I already have a question on Moodle about it, and I would like. I'm asking you to do uh, make a response, and then also to respond to one other person. So, so you do two things after having read it. One is respond to the question I've given, and the second thing is to uh, respond to one of your students. Now, that doesn't mean you can't respond to lots of your students. I would love that. Um, anyway, I want to save the last few minutes so that everyone can ask questions. I'm going to unmute you all. Um, I'm going to respond right here to Reef, who says, do you think God stays in heaven 
because he too lives in fear of what he's created here on earth. And which of course is making the reference uh, to, uh, to the famous saying as well with that. And, and I would say absolutely not, but I would say that it is a wonderful quote. I love that quote because uh, th that quote, I, I think that's from Nietzsche, isn't that from Nietzsche? Um, that, um, that again, we, what terrible creatures we are, what terrifying creatures we've become. So we've gone from optimism, how great we are, to absolutely how terrible we are. So I'm gonna unmute you all and just see if anyone has any questions or comments. Uh, so I'll just leave it out there. Does anyone have a question? Now I'm going to take that as a resounding no. Um, how about this for a question? How is everyone's spirits? Are you feeling good? Okay, someone giving me thumbs up. Um, anyone giving me a kind of, uh, it's interesting, I thought I unmuted everybody, but I apparently did not. Um, but, um, let's turn. oh, now you're all unmuted, so you can all hear each other. Um, has, how about, how about your spirits about the virus? Has everyone been a little nervous or not that bad? I just want to see other people like I'm really me too. <laughs> me too. Um, Even though I'm like such an introvert, like it's so weird to like not have that like normal communication that you normally have on a daily basis. And it's I, like, I just people, <laughs> right? Even though I don't like a lot of people or like being in a crowd, it's like. I, I just want to be there. <laughs> right? No, I hear you. I can't wait to go to church again and see people and yeah. and hug people even. Yes. I can't wait to be in a room and just chat with a bunch of people. Not be afraid to touch somebody. Right. Uh, it's coming. I believe it's coming. So, it's <laughs> Careful where you go with that. And I'm not social distance at all. Not even a little bit. Like, not. If anyone's going to get the virus, it's going to be me. So I'll be your guinea pig. I'll let oh, you know. So there you go. So go over there, hang out with Reef. Um, you might ask him to get out of bed, though. Yeah. And, uh, you know what I've been pretty curious about is uh, how's, how's Johnny Zacharias doing? I haven't heard from him in a few weeks. I just want to know how he's doing. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing fine, Drew. I'm real, Johnny, it's so good to hear your voice. I haven't, you haven't, you haven't even reached out to me. It's like you don't even want to talk to me anymore. Ouch. Ooh. Wow. Ooh. Drama. Oh, so we got drama in the room now. And um, so on my, on, uh, on my church's website, I invented this holiday today. I and saw that. it's called Ultraviolet Day. And I thought, wouldn't it be fun if everybody went out because, you know, it was happening because I was feeling kind of depressed because I needed some UV rays and I was already depressed. And I thought, well, maybe, you know, what if, what if we went and just started like raining down some UV rays of encouragement? So then I said, hey, let's make today the day where we just go and encourage people and tell people what we miss about them. And, um, like, I miss coming into the office and, and, and Lacey's there over here working in the humanities division, and I can come bother her, keep her from work. <laughs> I miss that. I miss uh, uh, coming into class and and chatting with everybody. I, I get. I miss. Uh, I miss you all a lot. And um, so make sure uh, if you get a chance, just send people a text today, uh, or send them an email, or 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 whatever it is, Facebook message, uh, Instagram, whatever. Just saying, hey, I miss you, and this is what I miss about you, because, man, you're great. Um, 
anyways, for there, so just to be clear before we go, is everyone understanding? So we, it, so it, it's required that we meet on Mondays, and then I will be here Wednesdays and Fridays for people to come, and I'll answer any questions. But everything else will be online on the Moodle site. Does that make sense? Yes. I'm also recording this class, so and I will post it on the Moodle as, on Moodle as well. So if you want to go back and listen to my thoroughly fascinating, I'm sure, talk about modernism, you can. Uh, or if you happen to miss it, but please uh, make sure you're here on Mondays. We're taking record on that. Uh, and make sure you respond. So we really are requiring everyone to respond to the questions that are in Moodle. And so go there regularly and, uh, and then start doing the reading. So read J. Alfred Prufrock and then begin reading because uh, it's, it's a long one. It's a small novel, very short. It's more like a novella and that's The Heart of Darkness. So you have your midterm due Wednesday and Heart of Darkness we're going to start talking about on Monday. Does that make sense? All right, yes, so sir. blessings, everybody. And I'll stick around if anyone has a question. Otherwise, you guys have a great week. Uh, Reef, go back to sleep. <laughs> and uh, so you're welcome to skedaddle if you like, but I'll just stick around here for a few more minutes. I've got another class in 15 minutes. But um, <laughs> and anyway, so I'll see you guys. Bye. Bye. Night, night. To my cats, because <laughs> cats. Ready? Let's see. Jacob, are you here still? Yeah. I'm hey. still here, yeah. And because I want to answer your question. Okay. Yeah. Do I, I can. Uh... Mike. Oh, yes. Oh, look at your kitty. I used to have a kitty just like that. This is one of two. Oh, ring off. Oh. All right. So, do you guys have questions, all of you? I came for the cat. Oh, perfect. <laughs> all right. So, and then uh, I'm going to. So, so what could I answer for you, Jacob? Or do you need Alana to sneak out? Uh. Sorry, what was that? I couldn't hear you. I just wondered if I could ask you the question, or answer your question. Right, yeah, okay. Okay, yeah, so um, just for my final, I just wanted to get your approval on my subject. Okay. So essentially, what yes. I've decided to write about, I wanted to do a full research paper, the eight pages on that, on um, <laughs> the, the language of um, monologues. So the art of monologuing, how um, throughout literature, there's, there's so many different monologues, like in one of the most famous ones we have um, in Julius Caesar. Um, you know, we have, we have the, at the end, or, or in the middle, I guess, we have the, the character. Um, man, it's been a long time since I read Julius Caesar. I know which one you have. It's where he comes out and probably one of the most famous. Years. So. Yeah. Friend, you know, friends, Romans, countrymen, let me your ears. You know, like that's just right. You know, he's just he's just Absolutely. talking to his crowd. Absolutely, and of course, the Tempest also had some good mm -hmm. uh, monologues. Um, you had Satan's awesome monologue mm -hmm. in Paradise Lost. You could, go, you could even compare it to some modern monologues in modern film if you want. Yeah, yeah, that'd be fantastic. Definitely. Okay. Great. Awesome. Awesome. Do it. Go for it. All right. Um, and cat number two. Oh, what's what's this one's name? So the black one is Ryu, which is Japanese for dragon. He looks like toothless. And then the first cat is Fei, and his name is Irish for raven. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I'm gonna have to run unless you have a question because okay. someone's outside my door. Wait, I don't. Oh, okay. Hey, stop. Alana, thank you. Of course. And I will.
see you. We'll see you. And I'll be here if you ever need have any questions or just get bored. I'll be here at 11 oh, yeah. o'clock Wednesday. I probably Friday. will. <laughs> so yeah, come on in. It'll, that'll give you just some to talk to on. other people. <laughs> yeah. Do it. Do it. Do it. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah.